Welcome, everyone. My name is April Edwards. I'm a senior developer advocate at GitHub. Uh, I live here in the UK. I live literally right down the road. Well, not down the road, but down a train right away. Um, I joined GitHub about 11 months ago. I came from Microsoft. Uh, I was on engineering at Microsoft. I was an advocate. I was in technical kind of design roles. So we're going to take a journey today of how GitHub builds GitHub because we eat our own dog food, or as I like to say, we drink our own champagne. Um, and I want to start off, and I'm actually talk a little bit about my journey at Microsoft. Why? Because Microsoft is a very large enterprise. So you take 50,000 engineers and go, how do you embrace DevOps mentalities and change your engineering practices? And then we're going to go into how GitHub does it because we are actually very different companies. When people are like, oh, you're the same company. Yes, Microsoft owns us, but we're very different entities. Um, I, I can tell you from as an employee perspective, um, different HR process, everything's different. It's not the same. Um, the, you know, There's some driving from the top, obviously, but we do operate very independently and we have different engineering practices. So I want to go ahead and start off how we define DevOps. And this is going to be really important because a few of you here use an AWS. So, uh, I didn't see any hands for uh, GCP. Uh, but you're all, and some of us are probably still using on-prem practices. So when we talk about some of the tooling we're using, this will be really important. But we want to define DevOps as a union of people, process, and products or technologies to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. Because here at GitHub, we don't care um, if you know we have the coolest features, but if you're not using it, it's not delivering value to you, you're not going to use it. A lot of your organizations and enterprises have potentially invested in tools, and you have like six different tooling that you're using to deliver your code, and you're going, this is hard. This doesn't add value. It's not adding value to our end users. So we're going to talk a lot about the, um, the tooling side today, but I want to talk a little bit about the people side as well, because the people change is the hardest part of this. To adopt a tool to understand these practices that we use at GitHub, we had to do people first. Um, and the process is really important, and the product is inconsequential. If you don't want to use GitHub, don't use GitHub. You've got to use the tool that's right for you. But you need to get the right habits in your teams and the DevOps practices. So how did Microsoft do this? And I want to talk about how Microsoft did it because this has kind of transferred a lot in my career. We had to adopt, adopt a growth mindset. How many of you have been in a role and you're working and someone goes, I need this done yesterday, and you're not good enough, and you're not going to get it done, and they challenge you? Um, where I was taught this failure was actually an opportunity to grow and to learn. And that was actually a really good change in my career because I spent the first 15 years of my career being told if I did something wrong, I was going to get fired. So having this growth mindset was really important. We're always learning. We also had to become culture, um, have a culture of customer obsession, but then shared objectives. Now, why is this important from a cultural side? Now, if you think you're on the development team, you work with operational teams, security teams, you have different objectives. The operational team is there to keep things on 24 by 7 by 365. You need to push new features, and those things often conflict. So if we're not delivering that same value to our end users, we have different working practices, which is really different. So we had to kind of align all of that. We had to change our definition of done. Every single engineering product I went into at Microsoft and GitHub has a set definition of done. So we need to know what we're trying to achieve, and that could be a three-week uh, goal or a six-month goal, depending on the customer project or the feature product we're trying to launch. But we have set that. We have KPIs to deliver against that. And most importantly, we have a production-first mindset. So often I work with customers, like, oh, this is just dev. But if we're using bad practices in development environments, we're not testing, we're not securing, production's not going to have it either, is it? So we had to kind of think about how we delivered first with a production-first mindset. And then we had to change how we collaborated and we developed together. So previously at Microsoft, I was in a team that was over um, five different countries in EMEA. I sat here in the UK. Uh, and in those different countries, we had three different time zones. And that was hard. Time zones are hard. How many of you are completely remote today? Still? Wow, only a couple. I'm completely remote from my team. So I got moved to a UK-based team, so we were all in the same time zone. And that had to change how we collaborated. But each team had its own working agreement. Uh, each team was a feature team, and we had to enhance our security from day zero. So a lot of things I'm going to talk today about are how we did that. But we had these siloed teams, and we had to move them in together. So previous to becoming an advocate, I was a senior software engineer. That doesn't tell you what technologies I did or what I worked on, um, but we had to move those teams together. So we built feature teams. So that's how Microsoft delivers its products today. GitHub is the exact same way, because they're just good DevOps practices, and that's what's been really good for us. So each of the things I'm going to show you today are going to be a product. Each of those products have different feature teams. So we're actually going to look at live production code at GitHub in a few minutes. Um, this is being recorded. And for everyone in here, I'm always happy for you all to take photos and tweet, put on LinkedIn. When I show the live GitHub stuff, I'm going to ask you all not to, only because it's live production code. I don't want to lose my job. 
So I'm, I'm a little careful what I'm showing you all, but if we touch into some things that are a little bit sensitive, just a little bit of respect, right? I think um, it's going to be the fun part of the session. So very much we had horizontal engineers for years. Um, I was a cloud native person. I dealt with a lot with infrastructure as code. I hate data. Like if you see the D word around me, I have run and hide. I wanted nothing to do with it. But by building more vertical teams and having that production first mindset, I understood the data layer. I had empathy for it. I don't like it. I still hate data, but I understand it and I can, I can help and work with those teams uh, on those features. So we had our product, Azure DevOps. How many of you still use Azure DevOps to today? All right, quite a few of you. It's still a popular product, absolutely. And it was a journey. It was, it was Team Foundation Server 2005. It was a box product, and it sucked. It was Team Foundation Server 2005, but it didn't get launched until 2006. That's how behind the Microsoft engineering teams were at that time. So we moved and got updates out every three months, but we knew we needed to do better. So we moved to a cloud-based model, and we got updates out every three weeks. So at GitHub, you'll notice a lot of the features that you're using at GitHub today are pushed every three weeks, every two weeks, or every week. Each team has to find their Goldilocks principle. And what's that? That means that we have to find the right cadence for our releases that work for us. Um, previously, when we were doing three months, it was too much time. And you guys, as consumers, were like, mm, we need features, we need features, we need features. Because again, what's the value to you? So we tried out two-week sprints, and we just weren't getting enough out in those two weeks. We tried four-week sprints, and honestly, it was too much time. We had too much lag time in between. So three weeks was our sweet spot. Um, when I was on the engineering side, we did one week sprints with our customers. If a customer didn't understand DevOps mentalities, DevOps practices, and they're very much a waterfall customer, to go agile, we did one week sprint. It is like setting yourself on fire <laughs> and <laughs> you just, you run, you keep going. And it's painful and it hurt. And there were tears, there was frustration, there was alcohol um, and lots of coffee. And that was because we had to learn the practices, death by fire, but it worked. And then once we got into that one week sprint cycle and cadence, we can move to two weeks. And it was, it was hard, but it worked. And there's a lot of stuff we do with engineering teams today. So in 2000 and, oh God, what year is it? 2019? Um, GitHub and Microsoft had an acquisition and there's a lot of integration. How many of you have integrated Azure DevOps in GitHub today? One person, okay. Um, some people are using either or, some are integrating them. There's some integration capability. Um, and that's because we know customers are using both sides of the fence. So the reason why I talked about the engineering side at Microsoft is because it's a huge organization and we made an organizational wide change. Now GitHub was born in 2008. How many of you started using GitHub in 2008? A couple of you, yeah. It was source control, right? It was just source control. Uh, we had some stuff in a, in a repo and that was it. Uh, it. It is a huge monolith. The, the GitHub that I'm gonna show you today is the original GitHub from 2008. We've got some demons. There are some dragons and demons in our code. Um, so there are some issues that where you, some of you might be like, hey, why is that you know, a master branch and not a main branch? It's hard coded in our code and we're working on it. But that, that's, a big, that's a big dragon to tackle. Um, but everything we're doing on GitHub is built on Ruby on Rails. Um, it has a React front end. And if any of you have ever seen some of the MySQL outages we've had, MySQL. Um, <laughs> but we've got over 66 services running on GitHub, GitHub, github.com. We over, have over 1,500 engineers. And surprisingly, at GitHub, we have 3,000 employees. So Microsoft, 50,000. GitHub. About 3,000. It's much easier to make these changes in a smaller organization than it is in a big organization. So then let's look at GitHub accounts over time, right? We start off really small. You can see the Microsoft acquisition just around 2018, 2019. Um, and Microsoft made this acquisition to get closer to the developer to community and invest more into open source. And Microsoft is actually the largest contributor to open source, fun fact. Um, but yeah, it was there to help enable the growth of GitHub. And GitHub, GitHub has absolutely accelerated since that acquisition. So we have over 100 million accounts now sitting on GitHub today. Um, and it's been exponential growth, never stopping. It's been a huge change for us. So I made the move to GitHub because I want to do something different with myself. I love Microsoft, I love what they do. Um, no organization's perfect, but moving to GitHub allowed me to get closer to the community and other clouds, other code, other things than just Microsoft-focused products. So we do over 80,000 deployments on github.com last year alone. So that's quite a lot of deployments. We've got a lot of agile practices in place. Um, we have internal repositories. Everyone at GitHub uses GitHub. So we have over, come up, 1.9 million commits across all of our internal repositories. So when I say everybody uses GitHub, 
HR, marketing, sales. So if I go in to see a customer, um, they'll open up a sales engagement in a repository, they open up an issue and tag everyone in it, and they have a whole automated process behind it. So even our non-technical people are using GitHub. Now, for those of you that used Azure DevOps, the um, Azure boards was great for project managers, great for visibility for, for execs. GitHub is building that, and we use that internally. We're literally eating our own dog food because if we're not happy internally, we find a problem with it. We want to make it better for you to deliver you guys uh, more, uh, more value to the end users. So how many of you have connected to the github.com uh, API before, the GitHub APIs to do stuff, right? 4.3 billion requests per day. That's a lot. Um, great number to see. Um, we've experienced a lot of growth, and those numbers just keep going up. So how do we measure success? So I told you that we want to deliver value um, as an organization to our end users, but number one's performance. How are we performing? Everyone's going to have an outage. It's how you recover. One of the things that we had to do at Microsoft, and we do this at GitHub, is we are very transparent when we have an outage. We have a dashboard, you can see it. Actions is having an outage. Code Spaces is having an outage. Um, all hell has broken loose, everybody's crying. Um, but then the community tells us, because you guys are great at feedback. Um, I fortunately cannot fix half the issues that happen, um, but we can see when there's a performance degradation. So we measure that day in, day out. I'm gonna show you how we do that. We use Datadog for the most part, but we've automated all that. We've automated that internally so we know. And availability. Um, you know, we're sitting here in the UK, but we're all probably working for global organizations, right? I've got teams in uh, the US and Australia. We're literally running stuff around the clock. We're running content, we're submitting stuff, we're automating stuff. That availability needs to be there for you all. Because if you can't use it, you'll go use somewhere else, right? Um, and then how do we scale it, right? Since 2008, we've massively scaled. We've got to handle all these incoming API requests every single day. So scalability is important. And I work with two types of customers in my day-to-day, -day, sometimes more, but usually two. Startups, so how do we start Greenfield? And we have this Greenfield, we're gonna do something new and scale it out and grow. Then I work with large organizations that have giant monoliths that say, how do we transpose this into GitHub, migrate off of Azure DevOps, migrate off of Jenkins, whatever tooling they're using, um, and then scale it for such a large organization because that's a hard migration piece. And then productivity. Um, we focus a lot on productivity. Um, it's, it's a human thing. Uh, how many of you have used GitHub in the past and you're like, it doesn't do what Azure DevOps does? Yeah, and you get frustrated and yeah. And you stop your productivity. But it goes beyond that, it's how we interact. And I'm gonna talk about some of the tooling that we use, but how we collaborate. Collaboration is 100% of the game. Can you, you can add hooks into GitHub so you get notifications in Slack, Teams, uh, Discord, when something is happening, when you're pushing a pull, uh, pushing a pull request, when you're <laughs> creating a pull request, um, pushing your code up, doing all the things. But number one, security. If it isn't secure, you're not gonna use it. We have Brexit here in the UK, right? That's been difficult for us. Um, where data residency sits, how we secure our code. But even security, if you might work in a financial organization or an industry, healthcare, et cetera, where security is top priority. We need to make sure we're secure from day zero. So we have a master plan at GitHub. Does anybody know what our plan is at GitHub for GitHub as a product? No, no guesses? Yes. Open source. Open source. Build happy developers. <laughs> it's close. So why build happy developers? That seems like kind of a weird metric. Have you ever left a job because you were happy? Ever. I left a job because I was bored. People problems, tooling problems, couldn't get anything done. I became a developer to be creative. That's why I did it. That's why I stay in tech for over 25 years now. So to unlock this productivity from our developers, we want to focus on the developer experience. How do you see GitHub? How do you experience it? How can you work and how can you be better at what you do? Because a happy developer is a more productive developer. How many of you love doing those menial tasks every single day that you have to repeat? Anyone? Good, me either. Um, and that doesn't make you happy. So to make sure we can make happy developers at GitHub, we run development on day zero as a new employee running in production. So true story, start at GitHub. Day zero is pushing code to production. How did we do that? Does anyone know? Other than magical fairy dust. That's an acceptable answer. Um, no code on our local machine. That's step one. I see looks at like, what do you mean no code on your local machine? That sounds crazy. Now, I am running a Windows device here. I have a Mac, I have some other Windows devices. So anytime I go to run code, I go to do a thing, I have to set up that machine. 
uh, and working across machines. So the GitHub GitHub, remember this is a legacy application. It's a big monolith. It's been around since 2008. There's dragons. It takes 45 minutes for me to download github.com onto my machine. So that A is going to take me 45 minutes. We've got it down to one minute. Getting started. So how do we do this? GitHub code spaces. We spin up a GitHub code space. We run our code from the cloud. I'm going to show you all. We're going we're gonna to log in to GitHub, and we're going to actually run code from GitHub GitHub and see how easy it is to spin up. Um, I don't use this for just GitHub GitHub. I use this for every single project. I don't have to run code on my machine. I can go home today, open up my Mac, start coding. I can have all the packages I need installed. I don't have to set up my machine. I do a lot of cloud native development. I need ports opened. I need packages installed. I was talking to someone today about a Jekyll website. How many of you use GitHub pages or have heard of GitHub pages? Uses Jekyll, right? How many of you installed Jekyll on a Windows machine? How much fun is that, right? No, thank you. I do everything in a code space because I'm building it with a dev container. Everything's prepackaged and ready to go. That's how we start coding pretty quickly from the cloud. But it goes beyond onboarding. So yes, I can get code up and running in less than a minute. Near infinite compute powder. How many of you have had a machine that doesn't have enough RAM in it? I have ran tests locally and watched my machine just crash and burn. Like I heard flames coming out. And often, you know, when I work with customers, they're given like the dustiest, crappiest machines that someone could find because they're like, oh, you're a developer, you don't matter. So by having this GitHub code space, I can scale it up. So if I'm running tests in my code space, I can scale it up to the compute I need. Um, and it's based off of my compute usage. Um, better security. You know, we always talk about, uh, you know, we're always prohibited from doing things as a developer because our machines are locked down. So if we don't have to think about the device as much, we can create a secure environment. People can write their code and get going quickly. Uh, true story, I was working with a customer in Germany. Uh, great customer, great team of engineers. They didn't see Visual Studio Code as a developer level product, enterprise level product. So they had to use Notepad++ um, and they locked down every developer's machine. Couldn't install a package. So, okay, fine. We'll run some tests, do some, can't install a package, can't do this. The firewalls are locked down. Um, we couldn't work. It took us a week to get the developer's permission to the applications. And think of this every time you take on a new project. I don't know how many projects you all run with, but I could be running anywhere from four to six projects at a time. And if it takes a week to two weeks to get access, that slows me down and I become an angry developer. Um, and constantly updated, right? I, I love booting up my machine on a Monday morning or Tuesday, and it patches. And I'm like, oh, there's 30 minutes of my day. I'm going to go more, make more coffee. So having things constantly updated, secure, and having all that compute power has enabled us to get going on day zero. So beyond onboarding, we also use GitHub Copilot internally. Now, my colleague Mish is talking about Copilot later today. I'm not going to bang on about it unless you all really want to see some cool new stuff. I'll leave that up to you guys to like, yeah, can we see the new thing? Um, not part of today's, but we have absolutely saved time by using GitHub Copilot uh, internally. So we beta test it. Again, we're eating our own dog food to see what it's like. And we're using it on very bespoke code. So things like Ruby. Uh, anyone here do COBOL? COBOL coding? No COBOL developers in here? Wow, that's a first. Uh, we use some very unique and old languages. And so we're testing Copilot with that, but also just how we take on new projects. Helps us skill up and get started a lot faster as well. Um, biggest thing, though, is all the tools I'm going to show you today help you stay in the flow. So I've been in tech for over 25 years. I know I don't look a day over 21. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. See, you got on. There you go. Um, I, I struggle to stay in the flow. I might go look up something on Google and like, oh, I need to find this bit of code and figure out what I'm doing. And I get sidetracked or I go make a cup of coffee. I go walk the dog. So being able to stay in the flow makes me more productive. And also the reality of our day in development, like do we get to write code eight hours a day? No, we're in meetings, we're waiting on others, we're waiting on compute. So the time I have to write code, I need to stay super focused. So staying in the flow has been really critical. So a lot of what we're gonna, I'm gonna show you in a minute helps me and all of our teammates stay in the flow. So we call this how we, how we work at GitHub. So we have an initiative and that initiative could be whatever, and that could be a quarter or more. So the stuff you see on our public roadmaps at both Microsoft and GitHub is our initiative. This will be publicly available. So if there's a product you're interested in, we will absolutely publish that. And then we create an epic that's a few weeks long. And then we create a batch from that and tasks. I'm going to show you what these look like in real project boards in just a minute. Um, so you can see how we work day to day. So this is a screenshot because everyone likes a picture of the GitHub mobile app. How many of you have used the GitHub mobile app? All right, quite a few of you. I closed a pull request this morning, by the way, on my app. Very exciting. 
um, we're actually gonna look at the GitHub mobile app repo and how they deliver. So it's a very small team. So remember, we only have a one and a half thousand developers at GitHub. You can take photos of this, by the way. This stuff is all publicly available. It's when I go into the browser. Um, mobile team, very small. They ship new features to the GitHub mobile app every single week. So they have a small team, they need to work leanly, they need to automate things. Um, everything you see here in gray is fully automated from the team. The things that are in the blue teal color, and I apologize if anyone can't see the blue teal, I have the little human next to it for you. Um, that's a manual process. Now, how many of you have been a single point of failure? How many of you love taking holidays and turning off your phone? <laughs> yeah, me, even me, me too. Um, I actually um, was a single point of failure at one of my roles many years ago in the US went on holiday for 10 days, came back, and my manager had been crying. He was like a big military guy, and I'm like, hey, you okay? He goes, nope, we lost everything. Like, we lost everything. And for 72 hours, I'd sit down and manually rebuild all our entire systems. Um, since then, I still turn off my phone when I go on holiday and tell them I don't care and they can't reach me. So, what can I do to automate these things? Because the other scenario is, what if you get hit by a bus, which is totally negative and bad. What if you win the lottery and quit your job, right? Who is going to do those tasks? When you go on leave and you're checking in every day, going, oh, it'll just take me five minutes. So we automate the whole process so we don't have single points of failure in that small team. We also have a release captain. So every week, the release captain rotates through on this team. Um, there's, a, there's a rota that you sign up for on this team, and any one of their engineers, junior, senior, Super amazing principal can be a release captain. How do we do that? Because we've automated everything really well. They focus on building the code and new features, and they remove those re repetitive tasks. So we talk about DevOps practices and culture changes, we remove the repetitive tasks. Now, years ago, when the cloud became the thing, and then we got rid of like, well, we talked about virtualization, and then we moved to containerization, I was concerned I was gonna be out of a job. And so did a lot of people. They're like, oh, well, this cloud thing's gonna take away our jobs. But what we start doing now is we start automating more so we can be more proactive. You've, there's no way to automate your way out of a job. You've made yourself more valuable. And especially in a time of the economy we're in, the more value you can show to your employer, hopefully, the longer we're all gonna be employed in tech, right? It's a scary time for us. But that's why we automate these things. We don't have a single point of failure in small teams. Um, and almost every single one of our automations, we use GitHub Actions to automate for. And the reason why I love GitHub Actions is it's not just CI, CD. You can automate anything. And we're going to have some look at, the, uh, look at a few of those, uh, what these teams are doing specifically. Um, so what they do is they create a branch, a release branch for every single hotfix or release that's going to come out. The build is generated. It goes into test, and then it's uploaded to test flight. Um, they use a version number on every single uh, release branch, and they snapshot um, all of the unit tests, make sure everything's passed. Everything has to be green. And this is something we did at Microsoft as well. We run, well, I can tell you the Azure DevOps team runs over 50,000 unit tests per pull request. And every single one of those unit tests has to complete. It takes about nine and a half to 12 and a half minutes, depending on um, the shape of things. So every pull request takes that amount of time. We do the same thing at GitHub, all green. It does not go to the next phase uh, of test until it's passed all green. Um, we have an issue that tracks all of this from beginning to end, and then we create re release notes for every single one of these releases as well. So that's pretty cool. So that's all automated. Um, and then in terms of the actions, uh, we use actions in Fastlane to build, test, and archive most of our code, and we put everything into GitHub Secrets as well. So we don't. So what I'm going to show you today, there's no secrets. There's nothing there that's going to be um, terrible to show the world. Um, and we put in scripts into a lot of these. We build very custom YAML files and actions to do that. And the cool thing about actions is you can use pre-baked actions, or you can write your own. How many of you create your own actions for use cases in your organization? Yeah, I got a couple folks. Yeah, they're pretty easy to create, but then you can use pre-baked ones as well. So we automate all of our issues with templates. Um, every single org, when I say org, every single team at GitHub uses automatic um, issues with templates. Uh, I'll show you how these look. We can go and create an issue. So if you contribute to any of the open source stuff on even the Microsoft side on GitHub or the GitHub stuff, the community stuff, you fill out a template. And then that opens up a task for us and then we have full visibility into what you've done. I'll show you all that as well. But we can ask things like checklists, what's been done. Um, and it will automate the checklist based off of the actions as well. Uh, we do a lot with the GitHub CLI to automate stuff uh, with commands. So you'll find, um, we might see a few of those today where we'll actually have in the, in the YAML. But we'll use things like you can create an action. There's a great uh, open source tool called, 
or great action called Jason Ecto, Echo, Ecto, I can never say it, where it creates an issue based off of an action. So there are some great actions you can use to take that away. Um, if you guys want the link to that, I can share that for you later. Um, and then whenever this issue is created, we notify the release engineer, and we use PagerDuty for that. So we go ahead and notify them. Um, and again, you can use um, some actions that will fetch that API data um, and notify that person. Um, and we run four parallel jobs for every issue that, that creates. So each of those jobs is creating different things. So it'll create the issue, create the workflows, and then start with the um, creating the PRs and everything else that we need to do. So what does a release look like for GitHub Mobile? Um, first and foremost, we have to manage the versions. And version management is fun in any tool. Um, won't go into depth of having problems with that in Azure DevOps, uh, but at GitHub, it's much better. So we go ahead and run parallel jobs. Um, that task will open on a Sunday so that engineers can begin working on a Monday. Um, and each pull request that opens increments the uh, version number that's opened by that action and that workflow. So we can go ahead and release it and hopefully release by the next Saturday. Now, the, when it does release on the Saturday, it releases to the beta folks. So if any of you are on the beta program, uh, you'll have access to that. So a big problem I have is, because I'm an internal employee, I'm on the beta, I'll log into work on Monday, and everything's changed all the time, which is good and bad, right? Um, so yeah, they will issue, the engineer will complete all the tasks for the week. They'll be the assigned person for that. Um, and then it gets submitted to the App Store on the Saturday and usually approved by the Sunday for a Monday release on the App Store down here. So yeah, one week sprint cycles, pretty efficient. All right, you guys ready to see GitHub? So this is the GitHub mobile app repo. Um, we're gonna go through a couple different repos here. This is it, this is the code. So in the repo, we have their docs, they have a readme. Um, I told you how they have um, kind of the how we work. Uh, how we work is really important. So the top bullet point here is how we get things done. And actually I've made it bigger here. Every team has a how we kind of um, outline of how they run stuff. Um, this is something I learned many years ago in Agile Practices. Every team has a working agreement. We call it Howie at GitHub. At Microsoft, we called it like a team working agreement. Um, and we kind of reassess it every six months in every team. It's how we work. It's how you know how to engage with us. And it kind of gives us that team culture. Because again, if each team is running on a different sprint cycle uh, for different features, we need to kind of figure out what works best for us. So for the mobile team, they will absolutely have this published, um, how they break things down. And remember I said when you create an issue, it will automate a task. They put a little link in there for you, um, and we'll actually see that in just a minute. So once it accepts, um, it will then kick off and build the team and schedule everything in the timeline, and then the team works on the Epic. So these five kind of tasks that you see up top are all automated, and there's nothing you have to actually do once you've pitched that Epic as an issue. But it breaks down how they work on their, their stuff. Um, again, we use things like labels internally at GitHub. That label helps also create and um, uh, trigger a lot of the actions workflows that happen. So we break down in each team how we work, all the different labels, subtasks, how we set up the tasks, all the issues, how we link tasks, um, and all the different resources in the team that we use. So that's the mobile team. So let's look at an actual issue. So I'm not gonna go around the houses with all the issues, but you can see there's quite a few issues open. Some will be internal issues. Some will be um, like a retro issue uh, for the team itself. So we put in the labels here. So this is a public feedback. So there's the GitHub community slash community repo where you as a community person can go in and say, this doesn't work, wanna see this feature. This is a feature request. So we put in that label. So someone's filled out an issue. This is the issue here. It's added the tags to it. And you can see here it's been added to the mobile project on the right-hand side here. It still hasn't been triaged yet, but we can see that the original post is in the community discussion board, and there's also some context in the Slack thread, um, and then we'll go ahead and assign people. So when we create these new projects, I'm gonna click on this and hopefully it works. It automatically puts this task into our project board. So we have a ton of things in our project board. We have a ton, ton of views and tabs. So we've got our OKRs, we've got uh, what we're working in that quarter, new pitches, and it will put it into each of those. I need to be careful which one I click on, so let's see which one doesn't get me fired. Um, uh, 
screw it. What could go wrong? Um, so each team can design how they want this project to look. For them, this is what works. You could put in new tabs, um, but then you can see what's trending, what they're doing, um, what features they're looking to put on. Uh, let's see, make sure there's nothing too bad here. Yep. Um, so these are the must-dos. They call must-do, should-do. Um, our team uses to do, doing, done. But again, we're weird and old school and slightly boring in our team. So when that issue creates, this is a batch job. Um, you can see we add some tasks there, really simple. So let's say we're going to be working on the mobile team today. We want to create a new issue. We can pitch an idea for external teams. We can do an initiative template. We can do an epic. Now, the epic template is the one that kicks off the automation and a bunch of workflow files. When we go into the epic, we need to put what the problem statement is. Uh, we assign people. So we have a DRI. That's our leader of a project. We'll have a tech lead, engineering lead, product lead, design lead, et cetera. And then what are our measurements for success? These are all templated so that I or any other GitHub employee can go in and fill this out. So once this issue is created, it will label as an epic down here. Um, I can assign people to it. That kicks off our GitHub Actions workflows. So let's look at what this looks like. So in a GitHub Action workflow, how many of you have never seen a GitHub Action workflow before? Anyone? No? OK. Has anyone never worked with YAML? You'd be amazed. Uh, thought I'd ask. Never assume. Um, <laughs> So when we create this epic from a pitch, um, it gives us the label. It's triggered on the label type. We prep for the issue, spins up our runner. We give each event a labeled name, and then we incrementally increase it. It pulls the fields from the issue tracking template. Um, we include the how we work. OK, so you can see that there. It creates the tracking issue. Um, and it assigns people. So it can also assign it based off the username that created it. It will give it the labels, um, a set title, and the body working. And then it'll close the pitch So once it's been created. So that's pretty cool. Let's see what other workflows we have in this team. Um, the other thing we do is how we create child issues. We create epics. We talked about that. Team boarding. How do we onboard someone into our team? So we're not even just doing CICD here. We're just onboarding someone. So GitHub, we use handles. Um, you can use whatever handle you want, but once you're at GitHub, you cannot change it. So I am Scuba Ninja. So when you see Scuba Ninja flying around, that's usually me. Um, you tag your people in it. It creates your inputs, gives you an onboarding template. And these templates are literally you know, a to-do list of what to do. So where's a good way to use this for you? If you're using an open source project or even just an internal project to your organization, you could create a workflow that triggers. So anytime someone joins the project, hey, welcome to the project. Here's some things you might want to have a look at. Here's the readme. Here's this. This is how you get started. Let's get started with the GitHub code space, et cetera. So we go ahead and create that issue for each of these, and it checks in on, in on, excuse me, it checks in on you. And then we can run some scripts all out of these as well. Um, and then we can track when our new, new person's joined the team and how they're getting on. And it can send you a reminder to say, hey, it's been a week. Check in on so-and-so. Pretty clear? Anything else you guys want to see from the mobile folks? This is your session. Do as you wish. No? All right. Yes? Uh, how's the test flight uh, input coming into the system again? How's the test feedback coming in? So the question is, how is test flight input coming in? Um, let me see if I can show it. I don't think they have anything in here, no. So uh, with test flight, they will hook it into an actions workflow and a script. So most of that's already been pre-scripted, and then they call the script from the actions workflow. Um, and on GitHub GitHub, actually I'll show it to you as well. We do the same thing. We pull a lot of our data from like a third party, so Datadog, test flight. And then we have an action workflow that runs on a cron job, so a chrono chronological schedule. So that you can see this one runs, pulls that data, and gives an output. Um, I'm working with the Codespaces team to get output on some of their metrics. And we're actually putting it into Power BI, only because the, the person who voluntold themselves was like, oh, let's do it in Power BI. And I'm like, tag your it. Again, data. I'm, I'm stepping back, right? Not, not my bag. So let's look at GitHub GitHub. This is GitHub.com. Um, you guys want to make some changes? All right, so I want to walk you through how we work at GitHub and actually show you like realistically what it looks like. So 
Normally, you're getting started on a repository. What would you do? Readme's are good, yeah. Um, we want to clone our code, right? And we've got a big monolith. What dependencies do we need? How many of you worked on projects that don't have any dependency listings or anything? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of open source projects. Uh, the Kubernetes project um, doesn't have any, like, it doesn't. <laughs> Anyways, so in every single repository that I work in that uh, GitHub has internally, do you see that .dev container folder here? Every repository should have a dev container configuration. Now, we have a lot of configurations because we have so many different types of builds. So I'm gonna go into what this looks like in a minute. Uh, but this tells the GitHub code space or VS code what we need pre-baked in, okay? So let's go back to GitHub, GitHub, go down to the readme, neat. So we got things, we got places we can go, we have getting started, it's a pretty short readme. Um, Actually, we're going to do something a little different instead of going to the readme. We're going to ask GitHub Copilot. Yeah, why not? So we'll start with GitHub GitHub. Um, and if you all saw me, I'm in the repository, I'm in the, the, uh, the website. So the, the new GitHub features that are getting released like literally any day now, we've put it in the web browser. I don't have to switch context. I've logged into GitHub GitHub. I want to ask it. Um, how do we build a website? Maybe it will know. So what it's going to do, it's going to reference GitHub GitHub. Uh, it's going to give us some steps and we can look at that. Okay, that's pretty generic, but maybe you want to look more on the GitHub website. So actually GitHub, we use feature flags. How many of you use feature flags? I love a feature flag. Turn on, turn off, screws up. You just turn off and nobody dies. Um, I'm going to ask Copilot, how do we use feature flags? Hmm, it's not playing the game today. So it's giving us very generic answers. I want to actually go back in and do this a little differently to show you guys all the new stuff. Let's go back there. So when we go to GitHub in the, in the uh, browser now, we can see different things. What we've added is doc sets. They've actually changed the name of doc sets as of like a day ago. I don't remember what we've called them, but we've indexed our repository. So instead of going through all the readmes and all the things, I can go into GitHub docs. Uh, I can go into GitHub GitHub, select it here, because that's the repository we're in. And I say, how do we use feature flags, and it should give me the answer from our docs internally in the repo. But sometimes Copilot likes to be a finicky beast while I'm standing on stage and everyone's watching. Yep, yeah, it's gonna be a finicky beast today. Let's try a different repository. Hmm. So the ones that are indexed here, I can see, we can see the different doc sets. I can look at GitHub Engineering, I can look at GitHub Advanced Security. I'm gonna look at, let's see what's engineering. So the doc set is a collection of these different repositories. These are the ones we're using um, on the engineering side. So maybe I'm gonna ask it, uh, how do I use feature flags? Actually, yeah. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't like this, we'll ask it a different question. But it can only reference those uh, repositories that we've told it to index. It's getting better, it's giving me one reference. It could be worse, it's not being nice to me today. This is the problem with being on beta. So they actually change our, okay, it's giving me something. Okay, better. Okay, this is what I wanna say. Third time's a charm. So when we've indexed our repositories, these are our private internal GitHub repositories. So one of the biggest issues with, with Copilot is, well, in general for all of us, is we're using private repositories. We don't want our code public, right? So we've created the ability to reference and index our own repositories. So I can search here to go, how do I do this? Um, I can see that it's referenced six different um, documents for me. It tells me where the documents are and what line items I need to see. So I know for me, getting started writing feature flags, there's a feature flag rollout markdown I can read, and there's a playbook. 
awesome. So those are the ones I would go to. But also, it's gone in here, and it's given me directions, but it's shown me the reference of where it's, of where it's referenced it from, and it's given me some sample code. So this is really cool. We know how we can write a feature flag, we can change some code, um, and then I can even click on this doc and go to the document here. And it takes me straight to that document. Move that out of the way. Okay, so I can get started and understand feature flags. So I don't have to leave my browser, because again, that's context switching. So that's kind of the new things we put into the browser with GitHub. Um, and with the new Copilot in, uh, in the IDE, so JetBrains, VS Code, you can also reference specific lines of code. So if you have documentation within your um, in your repo that's on your machine, you can also reference it there. But this is, gives you the UI experience. Um, I can see what we're doing, which is pretty cool. So I want to go back to GitHub, GitHub. Not that I can type. All right, so we kind of looked at how we can stay in the browser, look at our code, but let's get started. So I promised you all we could start writing code in production day zero in less than a minute. So normally I clone my code. I'm on a Windows machine. I need to think about my dependencies. It's a lot of data. It's like 60 some odd gigs of data in that, in that repo. So instead of doing that, I'm gonna go to a code space. Now, when you go to a code space, you can do new with options, which we'll go into. We can configure a dev container. Remember a minute ago, I said there's that dev container file. We already have these pre-baked in. I'll show you the ones we have access to. Um, and you can put a deep link. So in our markdown, we actually had a deep link to do it. But I want to do a new code space with options. Now, in this code space, I can see what branch I want to work off of. Yes, I'm sorry, we're still using master branch. This will change in the near future. We have some demons. Uh, but I can, I can run it from another branch. But I'm just going to go ahead and run it from the master branch. We have various different types of dev container configurations. If I am working specifically on actions, I will use the actions development if I want to. Um, for anything on the base.com, we also have larger actions runners development um, for GitHub Actions that we've specifically built a dev container for. So you might have specific languages, specific dependencies. Um, if you have a big monolithic repository, multiple dev container configurations are really, really handy. So I'm gonna go to the base.com development because we're gonna, we're gonna mess up the website. Now data residency, we're here in the UK. So Europe West is my closest region. There are more regions coming soon. I believe Australia was released not too long ago in Southeast Asia. Um, and then machine type. Ooh, 16 cores, okay. Now, because, because we know GitHub GitHub is so big, we don't let you go anything below 16 cores and um, 64 gigs of RAM because we just know we cannot run our code on that. However, smaller repositories, normal people, could start off with two cores, eight gigs of RAMs, or four cores. Um, and you can start at that lower, um, that lower threshold for compute, and then you can scale it up. So if I'm working in a lower compute area and I'm running tests uh, or something happens, it will tell me to scale up and I can do that. Um, the other thing we have are pre-builds that make these go a lot faster. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the 16 core, 64 gigs of RAM, create our code space. So we're gonna sit here and, oh, needs permissions. Yeah, fine, what could go wrong? And actually, this is a brand new machine I've, I brought with me today, so uh, proof is in the pudding. So we'll let this spin up. Oh, I need internet. Come on, guys. There we go. I might switch Wi-Fi if the, yep, okay. Let's switch Wi-Fi. Yes, this is internet dependent. No laughing at the names, come on. I have one that says IP freely, and I had to actually take that off my phone because I was at conferences, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's probably not the best thing to, to put up there. Right, so the good news is when a code space doesn't work, we just restart it. Um, so let this restart. So 
So why do developers write code in dark mode? Because the light attracts bugs. <laughs> that is literally the only joke that I know. Um, so it's setting everything up. Um, I'll give this a minute to spin up. It's going to load up some stuff. Uh, let's go through here. So this looks like VS Code, right? We all like VS Code, we're happy. VS Code's my favorite IDE. Um, so it's given us a code space that tells us down here, code spaces, and gives it a really fun name. So we're gonna be a fluffy ze zebra today. Um, and it's loading all this code up. So it's all loaded, we're good to go. And that took what, how long? Anyone time it? Did that take 46 minutes? So we can start making changes to our code now. We can start a, um, a good working branch and make changes, and we're good to go. The other cool thing about using a GitHub code space and why we can uh, work so quickly is I can connect my VS Code profile to it. So all the extensions that I love and prefer are in here, but also we can preload extensions that people might need. So how do we do this? And I want to just go through the dev container file of how we do this. So remember we had like all those dev container options. Um, we're going to go to the uh, legacy code base one. And I will make this bigger for everyone, because like me, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure everything is getting smaller as I get older. So we give our, we give it a name. We also run some commands on creation, post create, start, and post attach. Um, we have uh, different scripts that run. This is a massive beast of a dev container build. Um, there are much simpler versions of dev containers that you can spin up. You can get one configured in a couple minutes. Um, but then from there, we then go ahead and we run a nightly build as our image that we're running on line 14 here. Um, and so we have the latest up-to-date environment to write our code from. So it doesn't matter what my machine is. I have that there. That's there. That's set up for me. Uh, the other thing we can do is host requirements. So remember when I was booting this up and I was like, oh, you have to have 32 gigs of um, RAM, it tells us there what we must have, because we just know the requirements from this repo are just going to be heavy. Um, we can do all things like port forwarding. Now, anytime you're running a website, you are doing any kind of cloud-native development, be able to declare the ports you need access to are really, really good. I was working with someone recently. Um, we were doing stuff with Azure Functions and some cloud-native stuff, and she goes, I can't get the ports working. I was like, well, just build a dev container and put the ports in there. She's like, oh, that won't work. It worked. And within a couple of minutes, we were up and running and coding. So stuff for me for cloud native development, the port forwarding is really important, any kind of websites. We can declare any application ports we also want, um, any kind of attributes, so we can start labeling our ports. Um, so we can see you know, port 80 for our web. Uh, we can see that our SSH ports and the Copilot API. So then, we, then if you use the Copilot API, you can see what port that calls to. And this is a pretty big beast. Um, VS Code extensions. This gives us everything we need to do to write to code in GitHub GitHub. If I had to actually install these, download, and figure out what they are, we'd be here a while. Um, so this tells me everything I need, plus the extensions I want are in there. So that's pretty cool. Go down a little bit more. Again, some permissions on actions, all this other good stuff. This is a beast of a file. But that's our configuration. Um, other things we can do is we can then connect into our actions uh, extension. We can do all sorts of stuff, but this is it. This is GitHub, GitHub in the code base. Now let's look at how we're using actions for that as well. Um, before I go into that, so you can see we have some actions running. We have, uh, I'm actually going to pull this one up as well. We have a lot of actions for GitHub, um, if you can imagine. Like, it just kind of keeps going and going. Um, I'm going to show you two of my favorite because I'm biased. Code QL, security. So uh, we enable GitHub Advanced Security on every single repository, um, on our main branches, master branches, um, any branches we create. And Code QL will go ahead and scan our code as data. Um, the problem is that's picking up the code after it's been pushed to the repo, right? Once you push a password, password's for life. To scrub a password is really difficult, so we use other things like push protection, et cetera. But we are constantly scanning our repositories uh, and performing code analysis. So this one is triggered on a pull request. We have others that run on um, a chronological job. So I told you all we pull Datadog stats. Um, so we pull all of our reporting out. We've done 670,000 workflow runs of this alone. Um, and on the Datadog stats, we run this um, on a push, workflow change, 
and a completed workflow. Um, we have other ones that we'll pull it. So this will hook into the Datadog API, pull the metrics, and then pull it out into our different reporting tools. So then when we go to report to you all as the customer that we're having an outage, it's because we've pulled this and ran this on every push as well. So that is our end to end of GitHub GitHub. Um, is there anything else you all want to see on GitHub? So we do use project boards as well. So lots of project boards. Um, and then issues. We have a ton of issues also using templates as well. So we will go ahead and create security vulnerabilities, bug reports, any kind of feature flag rollout. So we could go ahead and create an issue for a feature flag that we were looking at earlier um, and all the other good stuff. So yes, everything is absolutely automated end to end. We work almost 100% in the browser. Uh, which is pretty cool. So, questions? Yes? You said you try and um, minimize repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. How do you manage stand-ups and that sort of thing, that necessary sort of communication with the team? How do you sort of keep that fresh? So the question was, if we're going ahead and automating everything every day and minimizing those day-to-day -day tasks, how do we do the, the stand-ups in our normal ceremonies? As someone who works in agile methodologies, you keep those. Because we don't want to automate our way out of life, right? We're, AI is a big hot topic all over the world. A lot of us are going, AI is going to take over the world. It's not. It's there to help us. We need the human element. And we are making the decisions. So those ceremonies absolutely need to stay in place. So we do maintain our stand-ups. We maintain our retros. But what we do is we create the... Um, we use an actions workflow to create the templates for that. So every week in our team, we do like a leadership report. And everyone goes and fills it out but we've automated the process so that no one forgets. We all get a notification and we're good to go. So we do keep the ceremonies in play 110%. And I think that's the important thing. This is tech, but we're still the humans. We're still driving the boat. We just have a little like co-pilot next to us helping us. And then, yeah, but we, it's the repetitive stuff that is more like, I'm gonna go in and run a task all the time, right? Or creating issues. We automate all that as well. Um, and we have triggers all over the place. So that if something happens, it automates a process or a scan and automate the testing as well. Uh, yes. How does coding from the browser work if you have unstable or no internet? You don't. So what I can do is I can go into GitHub, GitHub, and that's a very good question. I can click on the GitHub, GitHub. Now, there's a few things I can do. I can, um, they've changed how this is. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to open this and see if it breaks. I can open up that code space locally. And that's what it's doing right now. So I've opened up GitHub, GitHub in a code space. Excuse me, GitHub, GitHub in VS Code locally, but it doesn't bring my code with me. So the code is still staying up there. I can make changes. I can make changes while the code is offline. I can still have my VS Code locally in case my browser crashes, not that browsers ever crash all the time. Um, but I can work locally, so then you can then push those changes up, but you're not pulling down the code. So you're not gonna get any active changes, but you can absolutely work locally if you're working on an airplane or a remote island or somewhere. Um, so you're not pulling that code down. So that's another kind of security thing when we talk to customers and they're like, cloning your code. When we talk about security, security starts on day one when your developers clone their code to their machine, right? Because they've, they've got their code there. So by having it in that code space, we've taken that away and you can work offline if you need to. Yes. How do we make sure we don't break GitHub enough uh, with ensuring that we can fix it? So we have so many um, tasks and parallel things that, let me see if I can show you a couple of them. Uh, there's a lot going on in GitHub GitHub, right? So it's a very busy place. If I create a pull request, you, so you, you can't push to the master branch, so we have branch protection rules. Um, we also have repo rules, which are repository rules we've just announced which are awesome, so those are all in place. So anytime I do any kind of action uh, in the repository, it will run an action. So this one's running many parallel jobs. This is our CI build. So I can't just push code up to production. We have protections in place. So we're using environments, we're using parallel jobs. And again, everything has to be green. So if it doesn't pass all these tests, um, also a lot of times we'll put in a manual review. So if it's passed all the tests, we need that, um, that leadership sign off on like the final thing sometimes, depending on what it is. But yeah, I mean, I could go in and deploy something with a feature flag and it would go into GitHub, GitHub, and we could all see it. 
But I also have access to do that and the protections in place. Yes. You mentioned leadership would be that approval process. Is that, uh, did you, new devs, they get involved in reviewing code still? So the question was uh, leadership reviews. So a lot of times in some of the bigger features, we will get, um, when I say leadership sign-off, like we're still small teams, right? So we will often get maybe the project owner, the product owner to have a look at it, um, depending on the feature release and just say, yep, it's past everything, just to keep that human element in there. Um, but yes, we do pair programming. Uh, we do a lot of code reviews together and good practices. Um, on some of our gated processes, we have to have two reviewers. Right, and if any customer project I worked on previously, the rule, the engineering playbook we worked by, you had to have one uh, internal reviewer and one customer review. So it depends on the project, depends on the feature team, but there's always two reviewers and we still have those manual in there because we still have the humans to just make sure everything went and nothing failed. Uh, there's no um, warnings or failures. Yes. So yeah, so one day GitHub is offline. You've Yeah, so the question is, um, what if GitHub just goes down and no one has access? So GitHub itself, um, you know, this is actually a really good discussion. Some of we're talking about like resiliency and redundancy in repositories and like what's in play. And actually that's something I need to look up because I'm talking to customers about resiliency and going, ooh, what, what do we do for GitHub, GitHub? Um, we have multiple backups in place for GitHub, GitHub. We have things in multiple places. Uh, for things like actions, actions work on Azure VMs in the cloud, and we can change the data center. So for different products have different types of um, resiliency built into it. For GitHub, GitHub, um, we have resiliency built into the platform and a lot of monitoring. So if everything went goodbye, like I think we would all have bigger problems in the world. Like I'm pretty sure we'd lose continents at that point. We'd have to lose at least two continents to lose GitHub, GitHub. <laughs> and if and look, I'm gonna be honest, if we lose in continents, I'm out, like I'm tapping out. I'm gonna go sit outside and read a book or something, like, yeah. Uh, but same thing with Azure, right? If we lost all the data centers in Azure across the globe, you'd have the same thing. I think we'd have bigger problems. We'd have meteor strikes, all hell breaking loose, demons coming out of the earth, like it, it would be something bigger than that. Could we lose GitHub, GitHub? I hope not. Uh, but we do have a lot of resiliency in place. It is spread across various places, continent-wise. That's all I think I'm allowed to say about that. I don't know. Anyone else? Yes. Um, it's a big monolith, and I can see you've got like 900 pull requests on the go at the moment. Yep. What's the way, I guess the way that you're managing not putting work in progress into production is feature flags. Mm -hmm. Are there any areas of the code that feature flags don't reach? So the question is, we're using feature flags. Is there any area of the code that feature flags don't reach? Yeah, um, it's genuinely a breaking change, and you can't just feature flag it. Um, <sighs> No, we have so many workflows that run that in theory, we shouldn't be able to deploy a breaking change to GitHub. Um, but we all know that stuff happens. <clears throat> but we do have SLAs that we give to our customers. So we sh should have enough. I mean, so if you look actually, um, I can't go into the pull requests, but when you go into the pull request, you'll see 20, 25, 30 actions workflows running as that protection. So they're running their testing. Um, so like this one's running metrics, and I know it's really small, I'm sorry. Um, I can't go into what some of these do. I'm sorry, I know, the camera's on and there's, yeah. Um, we're pulling a lot of results and reporting on this as well. So it can't go forward until all this is gone. So if I look at a pull, I might be able to show you a pull request, hold on. Let's, what could go wrong? Uh, this one's running. This one's only running about five tasks. Um, this will go to into uh, productionwithproxima.com. Uh, it's a low risk. We have all stats in here. Um, we have quite a bit traceability. I think the other thing is traceability. So this is running a lot of checks. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Yep, that. So when you guys say like, can we deploy something in production? It has to go to all of this. I mean, I could count how many, uh, there's 162 successful checks thus far. 
So, I mean, it would take, a, I mean, we've built in a lot of automation to prevent that. Because we've all done, I pushed under production that I shouldn't have. But we didn't have all the checks back in, back in the day. Yes. Uh, how long is the turnover time? If you have um, to do a hot fix on this, um, you have to really to fix some of your core systems there, and all those uh, checks are in, in good place. Um, how long is the turnover time from I'm finished and I waiting the pull request, um, the check starts, I'm going to wait in hot fix post on. So the question was, how long does a hot fix taste, especially with all these pull requests? So, Dot com is a, is a beast, but I can speak on other feature teams. Um, like, and I can say, speak from the Azure DevOps, 12 minutes. Okay. Um, for this, it depends on what they're passing because some of the features are going to hit different parts of dot com. They're going to hit prod, non prod, et cetera. This one is a production level, but low risk issue, which is why I can show it. Um, it will tell us how long this takes. Um, so this has skipped a few. There are metrics. Um, we can also pull out, there we go, estimated time to merge one hour and 38 minutes. Right here. So this specific task um, will take about an hour and 40 minutes to push. Now that's, for, and that's a low risk. A high risk would get different priority. Um, you probably have more hands on deck and probably people with, um, the ability to push things through faster. So it depends on each product, but yeah, this one, this specific um, pull request is an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. Very interesting the estimated time for this. Um, how well is this based on? Is it based on metrics from the past and you're running a machine learning model over this? You're just taking the average of all the pull requests of from the last half year? So the question was, how is this number generated? This is based on the tests and the pull and the actions that are running. Um, and it will take an average. So we do have reporting analytics that we can go into that show us um, on our pull requests. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the analytics. We can pull up some insights on what our pull requests are doing um, and how long they take. So we, can ha we have a full dashboard here. We do get more granular reporting because as part of the Agile process, we'll say, right, this is taking an hour 40 minutes. Can we make that an hour 15 or an hour, right? Um, and that's part of the development process. We're always looking to improve our, our times. So, but that's running quite a few tasks at the same time. So um, yeah, each team will run, each feature team will look at those and try to bring down the time, especially if it's had an impact on getting an outage up or another feature out. Yes. What's your uh, practice about uh, regarding personal accounts and joining enterprises? And do you use your personal accounts in the GitHub? So the question was, do we use our personal accounts and uh, joined with our work stuff? So when I joined GitHub, I had my own account of, of Scuba Ninja. So Scuba Ninja is me. If you email me, I swear to God, I will not respond because email is like a black hole. But yes, um, this is my personal repository that I've had for years. I kept the name. I had to choose a name, and at GitHub, we're not allowed to change it. Um, that's tied to our email, our login, everything. Um, so yes, you can bring your own. So in terms of organizations, some enterprises will require you to use a different account um, because you don't want to mix your personal projects to your professional. So if you leave an organization, um, but you can absolutely, the way the what we call EMU, the enterprise something user, you can take your personal and link it. So mine's linked to open source projects, my personal stuff, Microsoft, uh, all the docs, all the GitHub stuff. But what's the trade-off on that? So would you recommend to a company not being GitHub to... So the trade-off is that, so the question is what is the trade-off? You can see all my projects, but you're gonna see all my projects anyways because A, I'm a kind of a public figure, right? Everyone here. Um, pretty transparent, but that's part of open source and embracing it, so I'm, I'm okay with it. I think if you're doing projects that are very separate from work, um, sometimes there might be a reason not to, but also if you have account issues um, and or your work has an enterprise issue, you can leave that and just leave it to them, so there is that option. Um, they've just put in a new feature where you can switch between all your GitHub accounts much more easily in your profile, so it's up to you. I've always said like work and personal separate, um, but I do open source projects and I'm pretty open with my work. This isn't my personal life as much, you know, and I can I have I can privatize repos that I don't want to put out there. So I use the same account. I do have other accounts, but um, I use this one primarily. Yes. Uh, would you recommend everyone migrates from Azure DevOps to GitHub practice? Question was would I recommend that everyone migrate from Azure DevOps to GitHub? No. Are there, are there any exceptions? 
No. Um, you have to find the use case that works right for you. There are, Azure DevOps is an amazing product, does all these things. GitHub is great. It's different. And we're putting in features that didn't exist, and we're building out the platform. But not everyone, everyone's invested into Azure DevOps pretty heavily in most cases. So they integrate. That's why we integrate them. Um, but they're not the same. So you have to decide what's right for you. It's the it depends answer. Yes. Since I don't owned by Microsoft, what is the future? Because I can't see Microsoft having two competing platforms under its wing. So the question is, what's the future of Azure DevOps and GitHub? Um, the original plan was to keep Azure DevOps around. We build Microsoft builds um, Xbox, Windows, all of it on Azure DevOps still. They have started using GitHub, but they're, they integrate into it, but the reality is they're still building other products. So in terms of sunsetting it, it probably will happen at some point in time. However, it's fully supported. The, team, the Azure DevOps team is still in place. They're still developing features. They've got a blog, um, but it's a fully fledged product, right? This isn't, so we're building it, making it better. We want community feedback. So these are all things that uh, we're quite aware of. So both products will be around for a while and they do integrate. Anything else? I think we're probably out of time. I appreciate you all sticking around for an extra few minutes. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I will be around for the rest of the day. By the way, it is also my birthday. So if you wanna buy me a drink, bring it on. Thank you.